If you turn, please, to Genesis this morning, chapter 21. Genesis chapter 21 and verse 1. And the title of my sermon this morning is Bringing Isaac to Birth. Bringing Isaac to Birth. Genesis 21, verses 1 through to verse 8. The Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born unto him, whom Sarah bare to him, Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old, as God had commanded him. And Abraham was an hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh, so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, Who would have said unto Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age, and the child grew and was weaned, and Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. Amen. Oh, Father, we ask now, Lord, for your grace and for thy mercies, Lord, upon each one of us now, Lord, that My God, we might somehow be able to capture our thoughts that like to run away with us, Father, and that, Lord, we could somehow pin them down now, Lord, so as to open our hearts to receive without distraction this morning the truth of your engrafted word which is able to build us up and to make us strong men and strong women of you, Lord. I thank you, Father, that even in this our day, Lord, thy word still speaks, Lord, and you still meet with your people, Father, in power and in unction. And so we look to you now, Father, I ask for your grace upon this man now to deliver your word and upon us all that will hear, Father, that in hearing this morning, we might prepare our hearts so as to hear. I ask this now in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. Bringing Isaac to birth. Patience is one of those virtues that we all speak about, but none of us really like to experience. It's a bit like saving. Who likes to save when you can spend? Well, similarly, who likes to have to endure the pain of waiting when you can have it now? The whole of Western consumerism is built upon this very principle. If you want it, you can have it. Got bad credit, as they say? Still come and get it. But it used to be that if someone couldn't afford a particular thing that they would have to wait, deposits were paid and payments were made in weekly installments until one glad day the final payment would be made and the product would be taken home with great excitement. But now we have it in reverse. Take the item home today and pay for it later. No one can wait anymore. The ancient virtue of patient waiting has almost been lost by modern man. Credit cards, Amazon Prime, the smartphone and the internet, and that's just to name a few. If these luxuries were to disappear out of our life tomorrow, some of us simply wouldn't know what to do. You mean I can't get next day delivery? I have to wait three to five days. 
I can't wait that long. It's my mom's birthday tomorrow. You see how accustomed we've become to instantaneous results. Forward planning no longer exists in the mind of 21st century man. That's old school. That's old school. Now, please don't misunderstand me this morning. I can be as impatient as the next man. I like it too when Amazon offers me a a free week of Prime or a free month's trial of Prime because it enables me to get next day delivery. And it's free. It's free. Now, that might be nice and dandy in the world of Amazon Prime, but I want to say this morning that there are still some things that not even Amazon can deliver next day. You can't get next day delivery on a baby. You'll be waiting the best part of nine months to see that little nipper emerge. And from the dawn of time, it's been this way. And until the world wraps up like a scroll, it will continue to be the same. I'll never forget the birth of both of my children. One always becomes impatient towards the end of the pregnancy. In that first and second trimester, all attention is on the health of that little baby. How's baby doing? Is baby growing? Is baby moving? Is baby developing as they should? But around the 36-week mark, as mom turns the final corner into the home straight, everyone's cheering the day when that little baby is going to make their grand entrance into the world. Those last four weeks are the weeks where we all wait. And if, like my wife, you go beyond full term, Well, every day is then taken up with the all-consuming thought, is today going to be the day? Now, this kind of patience, this kind of waiting is happy waiting. It's happy patience because one knows that the window of time in which one's working within is limited, give or take a couple of weeks, either side of that golden 40-week window of time. But what happens, because we want to be real this morning, when you and I are required to have patience without a time frame being allotted to us? That's not so happy patience, not so happy waiting, because there's no visible indicators by which to gauge progress. When on a long journey with the family to a chosen destination that promises to the little ones a sure treat. What's the golden question we get asked all the way down the motorway? Mommy, Daddy, are we there yet? We've just told them a minute ago we're nearly there. Not long left now. But no, they ask again, are we nearly there yet? What are we doing? We're encouraging them. We're comforting our little darlings in their impatience. Not long left now and you will have the desire that you wish. And it's great when we have such signposts along life's road. Cornwall, 37 miles. But how many know that in the real world of life it doesn't always work out that way? Sometimes we're waiting for things with no scheduled date of arrival. And all you've been told is it's coming, but you don't know when. And that's when patience, I find in my life personally, is really tested. Some of you here perhaps are waiting on God. You have a promise from the Lord. He's going to supply your need. Some of you are waiting upon a wife. Some of us are waiting upon a new job that you are waiting and trusting God for. Some of us are waiting for our family members to get saved. And day and night we labor in prayer, beseeching the God, Lord, you said it, and God, you're going to do it. But it seems as we look in the horizon, it seems to be so far away. Solomon writes in Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 12, 
Hope deferred maketh the heart sick. And that's graphic. We all know what it is to be physically sick, but to have a sick heart on an account of a delay in which we wait for that very thing to be expected, it can cause some uncomfortability in our lives. We're impatient people. Hope deferred maketh the heart sick, Solomon writes, but he contrasts this. But when the desire cometh, O oh glad day, it is a tree of life. And you may say to me this morning, well, Brother Paul, if that's the case, why the delay? Does God want his children to be sick in hearts? Does he not want for us to be happy? How many know this morning that the God that we serve is interested in far more than our happiness? As earthly parents, and I hold my hand up, we're awfully soft sometimes. We see little Johnny crying for a particular thing, and all that we can think about so quickly is how can we appease him to stop him crying and make him happy? But I want to say this morning that God is not only about making us happy. He does do that. Praise God. He's a God of great, bountiful mercies and compassions and gifts. But God is more than about making his children happy. He's of far greater substance than that. He cares for more than our mere happiness. It's character that God is after in every one of our lives, character. And character, my friends, has to be wrought under trial. Character has, is produced not in the fields of joy, but in those seasons of sorrow when God uses the fire of persecution and tribulation to wrought character in his people. God wants to work in each and every single one of us this morning. Friends, make no mistake about it. God wants to work the precious virtue of patience in each one of us so that we might stand complete in him by faith. And in order for God to do that, we're just going to have to experience from time to time the pain of waiting. I understand it's not comfortable. I know it goes against the grain of our very nature. The give me now culture. If I can't get it there, I'm sure to get it here. There's some things in life we're just not going to get now. There's some things in life that God is going to make us have to wait for because he wants to deal with our characters and he wants to produce in us this precious fruit called Patience, patience. Look with me, please, at James chapter 1 this morning. James chapter 1. And I'm going to read from verse 2 down to verse 4. James chapter 1 and verse 2. My precious brethren, my brethren, James writes, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, we're to count it all joy when we fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. The trying of your faith, when faith is put under trial, it produces patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting. Lacking 
nothing. Anyone can say that they believe in God, but let the fire of trial come to test that faith, and one will quickly discover whether that faith is genuine or not. True faith, we're told by James, are writing under the inspiration of God, the Holy Ghost. James tells us that when true faith is put under trial, when it is put into that vice and is turned to Titan and to Titan, when faith is put through the testing fires, James tells us that it will have the effect of it producing the fruit of patience. This will be the resulting outcome, the ability to peaceably persevere under trial. That's a good definition of patience, to peaceably persevere under trial. There's many ways to persevere under trial and not do it peaceably. We can persevere under trial kicking and screaming. That's not what God's speaking about. The patience here that James makes reference of is a patient. It's a peaceable, peaceable perseverance under trial. I think this morning of only a small matter, and I say it's a small matter, but I feel led to share it this morning. Recently, as you know, someone crashed into the back of our car and pushed in one side of our bumper. The insurance company arranged a suitable garage to carry out the necessary repairs. It involved fitting a new bumper. And our car was booked in for the 3rd of March. Well, it was the 18th of January when I was on the phone to the insurance company and well, that's nearly six weeks, you know, okay then, you know, fine. In the weeks leading up to the garage collecting the car, I was sent a link through so that I could take pictures of the damage and forward it to the insurance company to help speed up the process. They were able to order the parts required in time so that when they come to collect the car or when in March, the job should be fixed nice and swift. True to form, when the 3rd of March came, the car was collected and we were given a very small courtesy car, the whole family squeezing into it. And I was told that I'd have the car back within a week. Well, a week came and a week went and I left it a little bit longer before phoning up for an update. And I was told that we're waiting for the bumper and that it was now going to be the end of March, the end of March. Now, very early on, and I want to add this caveat, before the car was ever collected, I heard the Lord say, and it wasn't an audible voice, but in my spirit I sensed God speaking to me and simply saying one word, patience, patience. This was before I knew anything of the upcoming delay. God spoke to my heart and said, patience. I was now beginning to see why. This heads up, if you like, enabled me to put the next number of weeks and months into perspective. I was able to see that God was in this very small, minor thing. It's just a car. But nonetheless, God was in it. And he was wanting to teach his servant patience. God can do that at any time in our life, you understand. He can just put the brakes on and just say, come aside for a little lesson. I want to teach you and school you in the virtue of patience. God was allowing my faith to be tested and was wanting me, us as a family, to patiently wait upon him. And lo and behold, as the weeks ensued, one date was given and passed, another date was given, passed. 
until eventually the garage said, we're still waiting on the part and there's actually no date now for its manufacturing. We've got problems. We can't give you a date. James tells us in James 1 and verse 4 these words, and this is the moral of the story, but let patience have her perfect work. Oh, friends, there's a compliance on our part that is required. It doesn't just happen. Let. You're in the situation. God's put you in the situation. There's no way out the situation. And God's simply saying, let patience have its work. There's no point you kicking and screaming. There's no point you jumping on Google. All the doors of avenues have been shut and God's saying, I've got you right where I want you. Just rest. Be patient. Let patience have her perfect work. That you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing. So that you're able to persevere, to persevere without kicking and without screaming. Let patience have her perfect work. I want to say this morning that it's the yielding over our, of our desires to God that allows patience to have its perfect work. As we yield and as we surrender, as we lay down our desires and we recognize that we're in a divine moment, can we be in a divine moment over something so insignificant as a car bumper? You better believe it. God can use all things to teach his children. And as we're going to come on into in a moment, sometimes our downfall is that we fail to recognize this is a God moment. It's not just coincidence. We're fighting it and struggling and wrestling and we're failing to realize at times God's in the situation and he's wanting to us to allow patience to have its perfect work in us. We're exhorted. Let patience have her perfect work that you may be perfect and entire wanting nothing, and how true this is. When you and I learn to surrender to God, peace fills our hearts, and we're able to persevere in the situation with no date in sight as to when this trial is going to close, but we're able to endure it with peace, filling our hearts because we've learned what it is to surrender and to let go and say, God, have your way. I'm not going to fight this. I'm not going to change this. Just have your way. One dictionary defines the word patience as follows, quote, the capacity to accept or tolerate delay, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. I want to say that again. The capacity to accept or tolerate delay, problems, or suffering without becoming annoyed or anxious. That's a worldly definition. It's a good one. When we're required to wait, that we do so without becoming annoyed and anxious. Anxious is a big one. Do you know there's many Christians that are anxious? Matthew 6 instructs us that we're not to take thought of tomorrow. Tomorrow will take thought of itself. So many Christians anxious. Why? Because they don't know when. Bills to pay. Issues here and issues there, And we don't know how we don't know when, but God's simply saying, trust me. And if you and I will trust him, then guess what? We'll have peace in that trial 
The trial won't necessarily go away, but we'll know what it is to patiently endure in hardship and what it is to have peace. I like this definition far better, quote, patience. Christian submission to the divine will. I love that definition, patience. Christian submission to the divine will. That's powerful. Think about that and chew on that for a moment. True patience. Christian submission. Letting go. We don't like to do that very easily, but tell me, friends, or I tell you, friends, God will put us into certain circumstances where the choice is taken out of our hands. You've just got to let go. You can't do anything to change the circumstances. Surrender. Surrender. Christian submission to the divine will. Well, I just want to go back to the story and close for a moment. As May approached, we still had no news on the car. Remember, it was January. The phone call was made. We're now in May. No news on the car, but there was a breakthrough. A date now had been given for the bumper coming in. That date came and that date went, and I called them. Still no bumper. It was pushed back then a further week to the middle of May. But on the 19th of May, completely out of the blue, we received a text. I'd forgotten about it, saying that the car just like that was ready for us to come and collect. I heard the children screaming upstairs, my wife included. I thought, what's all that noise about? The text had come, the car was ready to be picked up. We can get out of this tin can, you know, we can get back into a little bit of space. It's only a small matter, but God was teaching his children the precious virtue of what it is to wait upon him. Uncomfortable, yes, uncomfortable, but let go and trust me and we can endure the trial peaceably. I want to ask you this morning, dear child of God, what are you waiting upon God for with a promise this morning? My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire wanting nothing, lacking nothing. What are you waiting on God for this morning with a certain promise? God has said it, but as to its completion, no date has been given. Are you allowing patience to have it's perfect work in you because you see God's accomplishing something in the waiting in that is perfecting patience. And when patience is allowed through us submitting to the divine will of God and recognizing this is a God moment, fruit is born in our life and we are told that patience has its perfect work so that we are then able to be made perfect, entire, and lacking nothing. Now I know that it's difficult, and I speak this morning about a bumper. I mean, come on, some of you are waiting on far greater things than a bumper. That every day and every moment of your life, it weighs heavy on your heart when, oh God, when, oh God, I think of the persecuted Christians locked up this morning in a prison cell. I think of that cry of Revelation 6, how long, O oh Lord? The martyred souls under the altar cry until you avenge and bring justice to our blood. And the Lord says, be patient. Some of you are waiting on God for 
for far greater things than a piece of plastic that's bolted on the back of a car. You're waiting for sons and daughters to come into the kingdom of God. You're waiting for spouses to be saved, for wives and husbands to be brought to you in that divine moment of time where God says, there's your wife, mate. Some of you are waiting for jobs and house moves and We are waiting as a church, oh God, for Sunday school teachers, for elders and deacons. We see the needs. We're waiting on God. When, oh God? I want to encourage you this morning to allow patience to have its perfect work. It's not an accident. I want to say to you this morning, it's not an accident. God has you right where He wants you. Listen, the omnipotent God of the universe, he doesn't even have to do that. And tomorrow he can give you the very thing that you desire. It's not because he's not able to. It's because he's not willing to. Because he has a plan in you waiting. But the problem is sometimes we can't see the plan. And for that reason, in the same passage, within the same context, James 1 and verse 5 What does James say? If any of you lack wisdom, in the midst of your trial, as God is working patience in you and you're saying, what is all of this about, oh God? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God. Lord, where are you in this? What's the point of my waiting What are you trying to do with me, O God? If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and upbraideth not, and it shall be given to you. God will give you insight so that you're able to put into perspective the things where you are. That's so important. So many Christians, when trials come, they lose perspective. They view things merely from an earthly realm when God's saying, come up a little higher and let's get a bird's eye view on it and see just exactly what I'm doing. Now patiently wait. And it makes all the difference when we have that bird's eye view of things. We're able far easier to peaceably wait upon God because we see his plan in it. And we're able to trust him, knowing that Father knows best. Let him ask in faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. We've got to be convinced in our trial of the character of the God with whom we have to do. We touched on this a few weeks ago. The goodness of God. The merciful nature of our God is compassionate and gracious. Some Christians, the minute trials come, they run and say, God, I thought you loved me. God, have you abandoned me? Ah, let us ask of God without waving, being fully assured of the goodness of our gracious God. That is because he loves us. He allows us beating sea waves to splash against the cliff of our lives it's because he loves us I want this morning to come again to a story given us by God this time in his word and we know from Romans chapter 15 and verse 4 that we're to read the Old Testament with New Testament eyes We're not merely to suppose that God's dealings with his people in the Old Testament was merely for a history lesson. But God wants to teach New Testament believers something about his character. So we can bring that Old Testament account into our New Testament experience and say that the God then is the same as the God now. Oh, reading the Old Testament is no dull affair. It's marvelous. And Paul writes in Romans 15 and verse 4, For whatsoever things were written aforetime, were written for our learning, 
that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. So we're able to look at God's dealings with people like Daniel, God's dealings with people like Abraham, like Joseph, and we're able to extract from that lessons to inform us so that when we find ourselves in that situation, we might draw courage, patience, through the account of God's dealings with them, so that we might be furnished with hope that the situation we're in is not to no end. It has a purpose, traced upon our dial by the Son of Love, as the hymn writer said. So let's look at the example this morning of Abraham. The title of this sermon is Bringing Isaac to Birth. Turn please to Genesis chapter 12. Genesis chapter 12. And we'll read just the first five verses. Genesis chapter 12. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country and from thy kindred and from thy father's house unto a land that I will show you. And I will make of thee a great nation and I will bless thee and make thy name great and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee. And in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. So Abram departed as the Lord had spoken unto him, and Lot went with him. And Abram was seventy and five years old when he departed out of Haran. And Abram took Sarai his wife, and Lot his brother's son, and all their substance that they had gathered, and the souls that they had gotten in Haran. And they went forth to go into the land of Canaan. And into the land of Canaan they came. Oh, friends, can you imagine? Where am I going, Lord? Unto a land that I will show thee. What faith Abraham displayed to put his hand in the hand of Yahweh Almighty God and to allow the Lord to lead him out of that place from birth that he'd known to a strange land that God was yet to show him. That's faith. Abraham leaves all to follow the Lord, but I want to add this. He does so with a promise from God. I'm not speaking about wishful thinking this morning. I'm not speaking about presumption whereby we think of something that we want and we nail it to God and say he's obligated to do it. Forget it. He's not obligated to do anything. Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees with a promise from God. God said he was going to do it. And Abraham trusted the Lord. And I will make of thee a great nation. That's the promise. And I will bless thee and make thy name great. And thou shalt be a blessing. Well, Abraham comes into the land and it becomes evident after some time that while the promise of an offspring still stands, the realization of the fulfillment of that promise had not yet come to pass. Putting it more diplomatically, delay, delay. Oh, friends, I've learned in my Christian walk that whenever God speaks, so often there will be delay. 
He wants to teach his, so, his children a lesson in patience, allowing our faith to be tested, not in the giving of that thing immediately. Will we still trust him? Will we still wait upon him patiently? Will we allow patience to have its perfect work that we might be perfect, entire, lacking nothing? Are all these things God is most excellently interested in? And friends, we have to leave our 21st century mind at the door because God doesn't simply operate on the terms and conditions of Amazon. He just doesn't do it. There's no next day delivery button in the kingdom of God. I'm sorry. I wish I could tell you that there was, but there isn't. And we learn in this account firsthand from God's dealings with Abraham that God wanted to deal with Abraham. In Genesis chapter 15 and verse 1, because our God is an encourager, God appears to Abraham after some time and he encourages Abraham. He encourages him. Genesis 15 and verse 1. After these things, the word of the Lord came unto Abraham in a vision, saying, Fear not, Abraham. I am thy shield and thy exceeding great rewards. God is a God of encouragement. And Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me? You see, by now, Abraham was growing impatient. I know you said you were going to do it, Lord. But when? You said you're going to, but you've not given me a date. And I'm waiting now many years and no sun in sight. Things don't look so good. And with all due respect, God, it doesn't seem like you're doing what you said you would. Fear not, Abraham. I am your shield and your exceeding great reward. Abraham said, Lord God, what will you give me, seeing I go childless and the steward of my house is this Eliezer of Damascus? And Abraham said, Behold, to me you have given no seed, no offspring, no child. And lo, one born in mine house is my heir. Eliezer, his servant, was going to inherit all that Abraham had because there was no son to inherit the possessions of Abraham because God had not yet fulfilled his promise in giving him one. And God brings Abraham forth abroad and he says, look up, Abraham. And friends, when you walk with God, this is how God deals with us. Oh, he's so gracious. He's so faithful to remind us of his promises because he knows that we're prone to grow weary in the waiting. God's not weary. He has all of eternity at his dispense. 20 years with God, it's a drop in the ocean, but with man, my Lord, it's so long. I'm wasting away here, Lord, you said it. God's so gracious. He takes Abraham out there into the night sky and he says, Look up, Abraham. Look now toward heaven and number the stars. Are you able to do it? He says to him, So shall your seed be. As numerous as the stars, Abraham, I'm going to keep my promise to you. Fear not. And Abraham believed in the Lord in verse 6, and he counted it to him for righteousness. Beautiful, beautiful. God reminds him of his covenant mercies. Genesis 12, Genesis 13, Genesis 15, God says the same thing to Abraham. I'm going to do that which I promised. In fact, as we continue reading here in verse 18, God enters 
This is now going to be for the fourth time that God confirms his promise to Abraham. God enters into covenant with Abraham. He puts him to sleep. And a smoking furnace and a burning lamp pass between the animals that have been cut in half. God enters into covenant in verse 18. In the same day the Lord made a covenant with Abraham, saying unto thy seed have I given this land from the river of Egypt unto the great river, the river Euphrates, the Canaanites and the Kenazites, the Cadmonites and the Hittites, the Perizzites and the Rephaims, and the Amorites and the Canaanites, and the Girgashites and the Jebusites. God was going to fulfill his promise. Now you think that this would have settled the matter for the fourth time. God speaks the same word to Abraham. I'm going to bless your offspring. Be patient. Wait upon me. And I will do that which I have promised. But you see, they still waned in impatience, waiting upon the Lord. Look here in chapter 16, and this is an important chapter. We're doing a whistle-stop tour through the life of Abraham here, and we're seeking to learn lessons that are applicable to us in our waiting upon the Lord. Now Sarah and Abraham's wife bear him no children. Ah, disaster, disaster, still no children. Ten years, we're told now, you'll read it in a moment, that Abraham's been waiting a decade. Lord, you've said it, but you've given me no date. I was 75 when I left her, and I'm 85 now. I'm growing old. Has it been heard that an old man can produce a child? In his mind, the window of opportunity was closing on him and God saying, I'm in absolute control, don't worry. Sarah, Abraham's wife, bear him no children and she had a handmaid. An Egyptian whose name was Hagar and Sarah said to Abraham, Behold, now the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. I pray thee, go in unto my maid. It may be that I may obtain children by her. And Abraham hearkened to the voice of Sarah. They grew weary in waiting. And Sarah, Abraham's wife, took Hagar, her maid, the Egyptian, after Abraham had dwelt ten years in the land of Canaan and gave her to her husband, Abraham, to be his wife. And he went in unto Hagar and she conceived. Ten years he'd waited. Seventy-five when he left Haran to come into the land of Canaan. He's now 85 years old. And he's still waiting with no delivery date in sight. If God would have told him, please understand this, that it's going to be in 11 years, well, there's hope. There's a date. It's a long time to wait, but okay. But you see, God doesn't always give us the date. And that's what makes the waiting difficult. But that's where faith comes in. It seems after the natural that time is slipping away and, away and so Sarah, as we know, has a brainwave moment. A brainwave moment. Let's lend a helping hand to God. Ten years, it's a long time. Perhaps God means to do it this way. You say there's no lessons in the Old Testament. Friends, is that not us all over? Is that not us all over? Patience. Peaceably enduring difficulties. 
Surrendering our will to God, knowing that he's in control and waiting upon him. Brilliant. Impatience. Struggling and striving and wrestling. When, 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 when? Are we nearly there yet? Perhaps, God, you mean this. And so we see now that the problem is compounded because in Sarah's suggesting to Abraham to help God out, Ishmael is born, and right from the very start, it spelt problem. And I want to tell you, friend, when you stretch out your hand to try to help God in that which he's trying to deal with you about in your life, the first thing that's going to happen, problems, are going to arise. You say, how do I know it? Been there, done that. Problems. It's best to just let God do what he's going to do. When she saw that she'd conceived, this is Sarah, it was her idea, remember? Her mistress was despised in her eyes. Hagar despised. Sorry, um, when she saw that she had conceived, her mistress was despised in her, in her eyes. Sarah despised Hagar. It was her idea. Because you see, Sarah was barren, we're told in Genesis chapter 11. She was barren. And now Hagar, her maid, is giving to Abraham the child that she should be giving. And so jealousy kicks in and envy and Sarah despises Hagar. It doesn't help the situation. We can think we know what will work best, but look, it wasn't working best. It caused problems. And Sarah says to her, my wrong be upon you. I've made a mistake. You would have thought that this would have settled the matter, but it didn't. It didn't. It caused problems. And how many well-meaning saints fall into this snare through impatience because they grow weary of waiting upon God? And I want to say this morning, brothers and sisters, take it from me. The last thing that you want in your life is an Ishmael. Because Ishmael will be around a long time and will be a thorn in your sight. Ishmael was born through Sarah's impatience and she in turn talked to Abraham and persuaded him it would be good. These problems only grow. Eventually, Ishmael's put out of the house. Cast this bondwoman and her son. Cast them out. For the son of this bondwoman shall not be heir with my son, even with Isaac. Genesis 21 and verse 10. The seed of the flesh could not dwell with the seed of the promise. And my word to you this morning, saints of God, is this, be patient and wait upon the Lord. He shall bring Isaac to birth without your interference and without mine. Bringing Isaac to birth Friends, you don't have to bring Isaac to birth. God brings Isaac to birth. Man brings Ishmael to birth. Man brings forth Ishmael. God brings forth Isaac. And I would to God that you take that word to heart this morning, in whatever matter it is. When man ventures to put his big toe into God's affairs, I tell you, friends, it muddies the waters. God simply says, stay out of it. There's some things that you and I cannot influence. We just have to allow God to do what he's going to do. You say, but I can't. Keep still, God says. Let patience have her perfect work. And see what God will do. It shall be said in that day, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him. And he will save us. This is the Lord. We have waited for him. 
we will be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Isaiah 25 and verse 9. Wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Psalm 27 and verse 14. Is God speaking to someone's heart this morning? Oh, friends, there's things in our life we're waiting for God upon. God speaking to us this morning. Hands off. Be patient. There's many things that we're waiting on God for. And I understand, Pastor, when's it going to happen? When we're we going to ask God? Ask the Lord. He knows. That's what we're praying for. Five times a week, join the prayer meetings. You're welcome. What are we doing? Twiddling our thumbs. We're saying, God, you said it. And Lord, we believe you're going to do it. We're standing on this side of faith saying, God, we're not going to charge you with being a liar. You're not a man that you should lie. God, you're going to do it. You're going to do it. And when he does it, which he will, we can have a praise meeting and thank God for what he's done. Adventures in faith. It's beautiful. It's beautiful. And so many pastors grow weary and they say, well, Jim over here, Tom over here, Bob over here, just put them into office. That'll do. And they make a mess of God's church because the Lord's saying, have the right people in the right time. Be patient. But how long, Lord, you've not given us a delivery date? I know, because I want you to wait upon me. Oh, take it to heart. In closing this morning, God makes it clear to Abraham and Sarah, Ishmael is not the promised seed. Do you remember the words of Genesis 17, the words of Abraham? Look now in verse 1. Abraham was 90 years old and 9. Touching on 100. Touching on 100. Has it ever been heard that a hundred-year-old man produces children? Well, in God's economy, Abraham was 90 years old and nine. 24 years later now, Lord, you've still not done it. The Lord appeared to Abraham and said to him, I am the almighty God. Don't doubt my power. I am El Shaddai, the almighty one. In absolute control of the situation. I am the almighty God. Walk before me and be thou perfect. That's our responsibility. Walk before the Lord. And I will make my covenant between me and you. And I will multiply you exceedingly. Abraham fell on his face and God talked with him saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with you and you shall be a father of many nations. Neither shall thy name any more be called Abraham, but thy name shall be called Abraham. Not great father, but father of many nations. For of a father of many nations have I made you. And I will make thee exceeding fruitful and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee, and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your seed after thee in their generation for an everlasting covenant to be a God unto thee and to thy seed after thee. And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Cana, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God's. And God said to Abraham in verse 15, As for Sarah your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall be called her name. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. And listen to this. Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that is a hundred years old? 
and shall sever that is 90 years old bear. And listen to this. Abraham said unto God, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God says, No, it's not going to be Ishmael through Hagar. Your wife, Sarah, at 90 years old. God said, Sarah, your wife shall bear thee a son indeed, and you shall call his name Isaac. And I will establish my covenant and with his seed after him. I want to encourage you this morning, dear children of God, as I close. Some of you are waiting upon God with a promise. In things that matter tremendously. And I wish I could stand before you this morning and encourage you and tell you, don't worry, dear soul, as your pastor, don't worry. It won't be long. But I can't. It might not be. It might be. I'm not God. But I can encourage you with this. If God has said it, he will do it. And mind not the environment around you. And mind not time. Wait upon the Lord and renew your strength. And let hope be set before you that one day there will come a shout of rejoicing and praise as God brings Isaac to birth. Who shall bring Isaac to birth? God shall bring Isaac to birth. Man shall not. The question this morning is not when shall I receive the promised blessing? The question of our hearts this morning should be this. What does God want to accomplish in the process of me waiting? Church of Jesus Christ this morning, what does God want to accomplish? Why he calls us to wait so long for the things we've been praying for for years. Have we not asked God that he'd give us elders? Ten years later, we're praying the same prayers. Lord, raise up elders. Lord, bring in shepherds to share in this work. Lord, do it. God will do it. He already is doing it. Beyond our radar, he's already at work. But the question is this, what does God want to accomplish in us? Remember patience Christian submission to the divine will. I ask you this morning, are you submitted to Christ? Have you bowed the knee to allow God to give the delivery date when he sees fit? So that while we wait, we're able to wait with peace and not with struggle. 25 years later, against all natural odds, Isaac is born. Where we began, Genesis 21, the Lord visited Sarah as he had said. As he had said. 25 years earlier, as he had said. And the Lord did unto Sarah as he had spoken. End of story. End of story. For Sarah conceived and bare Abraham a son in his old age at the set time at which God had spoken to him. And Abraham called the name of his son that was born to him, whom Sarah bare to him Isaac. And Abraham circumcised his son Isaac, being eight days old as God has commanded him. And Abraham was a hundred years old when his son Isaac was born unto him. And Sarah said, God hath made me to laugh so that all that hear will laugh with me. And she said, who would have said to Abraham that Sarah should have given children suck? For I have borne him a son in his old age. And the child grew and was weaned, 
And Abraham made a great feast the same day that Isaac was weaned. God will do, friends, what he said he would do. Let us wait patiently upon him this morning. This is the word of the Lord. God will do it his way in his time. Amen. Father, it's such a joy to read this account. My soul leaps within me. My soul leaps within me. Because, Father, we find in this account this morning ourselves, Lord. And, Father, you're, you haven't changed. You're the same yesterday, today, and forever. And Lord, I just want to acknowledge this morning, it is an, our absolute privilege to wait upon you. To trust you, Lord. To resign, Father, our wills and submit to the divine will of God and say, God, have your way. Oh, Lord, help us. Help us, please, to keep our hands off. To let you be you, Lord, the El Shaddai, the Almighty, lest we should stretch forth our hand to bring forth Ishmael. Lord, we don't want thorns in our sights. We want Isaac, Lord, the promised seed. And so we wait upon you. We wait upon you individually in personal matters. We wait upon you corporately as a church. You will do what you will do, Lord. Of that we are persuaded. And we say, God, do it, Lord, in your time, in your way. In Jesus' name, amen.